recording now. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending tonight's uh, training session. This is the third one of our Climate Leaders Program. And so tonight's session, we're going to be uh, watching a presentation from Jonathan Pruitt, who isn't available, to, uh, who isn't available tonight to present live, but he was uh, gracious enough to uh, record a presentation on air quality and air pollution in the Stockton area. And so with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen and uh, we'll just go ahead and kind of press play. Um, there's going to be opportunities for us to engage and participate as a group. Um, so when those moments happen, I'll press pause um, and we can go into a uh, discussion. And also, if you do have any questions uh, during the presentation that you were thinking of, please feel free to just put them in the chat since Jonathan's not here to directly answer them. And I will forward the, all the questions that you have to, to him and uh, send out the uh, answers uh, in our next update. So with that, I will go ahead and share my screen. Can everyone see? Yes. All right, awesome. So let me just make this full screen. And everyone can see this, right? I just want to make sure I've never done the full screen. All right, cool. So let's just hope that the audio works. And uh, away we go. William, I don't think the audio is playing. Okay, let me try it now. Can you hear that? Okay, let me figure no. out what, let me just figure out what's going on. Air pollution and air oh, no. quality. My name is Jonathan Pruitt. Okay. I'm glad for it's you guys to be here. Um, really hope this recording is helpful. And of course, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me and I'll for sure be there to answer anything you have. So from there, let's get started. I wanted to provide sort of an icebreaker. And in this icebreaker, I really wanted to give sort of a, 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 an idea of where we're at in, in, in a community, um, in the space. As you know, this is a safe space, so feel free to um, answer if you would like, you don't have to. But I wanna get an idea of sort of how many of you have or know someone who has asthma. This is a topic that's been prevalent in the Central Valley. And it's more common than you think now because of the area that we live in, we're pretty much destined to see a lot more folks live with asthma. So how many do you know that have asthma? And then the second question, which is kind of a two-part question, you know, where's an area that you've traveled that has had clean air quality. It could be in the, in the state of California, it could be somewhere else in the nation or outside the country. And then the other questions pertaining to this is, what about an area that had bad air quality? What was it? All right, so we'll go ahead and kind of just do a quick little icebreaker round. Um, feel free to either um, answer one or both questions. Um, but yeah, we'll go ahead and just get started. Hi, Joellian, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we're just starting the presentation off uh, from Jonathan Pruitt on air quality and air pollution. Uh, so feel free to just like, uh, we're just doing an icebreaker right now. Um, and if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to uh, say, uh, put it in the chat. So with that, uh, I saw Liliana put hers in the chat. So Liliana, if you wanna just kind of go first and then popcorn to the next person uh, with your answers. 
Okay, so I have asthma. Um, about 29 years ago, I had it so severe. I had to get two shots, but, uh, and some inhalers and so forth, but um, I discovered what I was um, kind of like going through and what was causing my asthma, and that was the air quality and what I was intaking. And as for the other, uh, the bad air quality is over there by Rancho Seco. I had to constantly wear a mask to be out there so that I could, you know, breathe a little, but I couldn't breathe without a mask out at the Rancho Seco area. I'll pop corn over to Vanessa. Um, I know a couple of people who have asthma. Um, most of them were like a school grade. I don't keep in contact with them anymore, but I did know that they have it. And then I'll pop corn off to Rain. Hi, Hello, guys. everyone. Oh, sorry. Oh, did you say Raina or Rain? Rain, sorry. Oh, okay, okay. I can call you next, though, Raina. But um, thank you, Vanessa. I do know three people who have asthma, and that's also why I wanted to get into learning more about air quality and the climate issues. So, for example, my older brother, Ron, um, I've seen how it really affected him, especially as a student athlete in high school. He played football, and the majority of the times he had to be put on the side because of um, his breathing problems. And um, for Liliana, I know you uh, mentioned that you had to take shots when you're smaller. I personally don't have asthma, but I do have a friend who I'm, I, I'm still close with now. And he would tell me that he had that same experience that he had to, to even take shots in order to help manage his asthma too and his inhaler. And I do have one more friend named Carlaine who's also into climate justice as well. And she would always talk to me of how it was very hard for her playing sports as well too. She's a figure ice skater, if I remember right. So I just really seen how it really affected people's lives growing up and the activities and the hobbies that they want to pursue. And then I will popcorn it to Raina. Hello everyone. So um, I know um, two people, my coworker and a cousin, but I've, when, um, when all the burning was happening in California uh, and they mandated that people would like should stay at home and not go to like classes or like go out like all the people that had asthma um that's when like everybody was telling me that they, they couldn't go out and I was like I had to run like errands for them because it was really the air quality was really bad so do we have to answer all the questions all the the other two oh, okay only if you only answer if you like want to or no or feel comfortable. Oh, okay. Um, I think the best air quality I've had so far, um, Yosemite, and the worst was at Merced when everything when California was burning, <laughs> like two years ago. I'll do Nick. Uh, yeah, I don't really know anybody with asthma. Um. But my wife has COPD, which I guess is a form of asthma. But um, so, yeah, it's, it's tough to to got to be careful what you do with people with asthma, because like even if camping or something like that with with us used to be homeless, we had to be careful because just the smoke from that causes a lot of issues for, for not only pollution, but for people with asthma and, and COPD and things like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's a fun little thing to, I guess, learn to deal with, to live around. Um, and then the second one, the state of Tennessee, best air quality in the world out there. For me, I mean, it's all mountains, hill, you know, hills, green, and it's just beautiful. The air quality is awesome up there. The worst for me, uh, Atlanta, when I worked for uh, the Atlanta – South or Atlantic Southeast Airlines at the airport, uh, right, right, near, before, during, and after 9/11. But besides the point. But yeah, that's the the worst air quality I've ever lived in was down there in in Georgia. 
And I don't know who hasn't been called on. So let's go with Julian Johnson. Julian Johnson. All right. Um, for me, also asthmatic, as well as a lot of the folks in my neighborhood. But um, in terms of air quality, I think the best place I've been to is like Seattle. Um, they have pretty good. I think there's this like a nine on the AQI scale. So I don't know if anyone else hasn't gone. I think the only person who hasn't gone is me. Um, and so I'll just say really quickly, I get seasonal asthma. And I know friends in high, uh, middle school and high school who had, had asthma, uh, definitely from like air quality and also uh, just like our local uh, environment. And then I think for me, best air quality I've seen was, or I've been in was like Yosemite. And then I think very bad air quality. Yeah, probably like just the whole state of California during the, the wildfire situation two years ago. <laughs> Never seen that before. But all right, so with that, um, thank you everyone for sharing your, uh, your icebreakers. And with that, we'll go ahead and continue the presentation. The objectives of this presentation is hoping we'd be able to get some sort of <coughs> ideas from you guys, um, allow before we go deeper in the slides i i want to provide sort of objectives um, in the objectives we're hoping that you know, climate leaders will be able to develop a basic understanding of air quality um, second objective is that climate leaders will be able to discuss air pollution with their peers. And last, climate leaders will be able to identify the state and regional agencies that protect our air quality. Now, here are some things to really start off with. So you guys, uh, either it could be a refresher um, or something totally new. Air quality. Now, that seems sort of a term that could be easy to describe, but there's actually a definition um, that is very easy to remember. Um, and air quality describes really the condition of the air that surrounds us. And pollutants, well, pollutants are pretty much substances that pollute, um, or in other words, that negatively affect um, something. And that's usually areas that are in the water or the atmosphere, more like things that happen within an environment. And the last bullet that I provided, which was the first law of thermodynamics. For those who don't know, this was sort of a, or those that don't remember, this is sort of an idea that came from your science classes, more specifically your chemistry classes. Um, this is an area that discuss sort of energy and matter and the, the characteristics among the two. And even though it might not be your favorite subject, I'm really gonna make my best effort to make it fun throughout this slide. So the reason why I presented this first law of thermodynamics is because it states energy cannot be created nor destroyed. In other words, something has to come from something else. It doesn't magically appear and disappear. So what am I talking about? What does this mean? Well, here's an example to get you familiar with it. Say you work at a coal-fired a coal fired electricity generating plant. The coal is heated, which produces electricity. What else it produces is waste heat that is transported away as cooling water or gases. And we can't forget the various waste gases that gets emitted into the atmosphere, which causes pollution, such as acid rain, 
which is very harmful for the environment. So in other words, all the chemicals that make up the coal is burnt and it spreads out into various forms. It doesn't poof out of nowhere. It has to go somewhere. I want you to really keep that in mind throughout these slides, um, just so you can understand sort of the context of what I'm gonna be talking about. In the next slide, we really go more detail on how air quality is classified. Air quality is usually identified as being good, moderate, or poor quality. Good air quality means that the air is clean based off federal standards and visually clean without any smoke, dust, or smog. Moderate means that the air is not clean and or clear, but is safe for healthy individuals, but may not be safe for those who are sensitive to air pollution. Those who are sensitive to air pollution may deal to symptoms like coughing or shortness of breath. Poor air quality means that the air is not clean or clear due to pollutants such as smoke, dust, and smog. No one is safe. You can even be healthy. No one is safe from poor air quality. You'll notice that great is never used because air quality can never be great. Air quality always has some traces of pollutants, which can be safe for some and harmful for others. In the next slide, we really go more in depth about the four factors of air quality. And the quality of air quality, the, the, qual the quality of air depends on the four factors, such as the amount of pollutants, the type of pollutants, the rate at which the pollutants are released in the atmosphere, and how pollutants are trapped in an area. I hope this gives you sort of an idea of how to classify it and how to look at it in a measuring standpoint, because these are very important. Because each one of these measurements really depends and sometimes are used to identify certain criteria of pollutants, which we'll go more in depth in the next slides. But I want you to think of, an, think of this as an example. If air pollutants are in an area with good airflow, they will mix with the air and quickly disperse. Air pollutants tend to remain trapped in the atmosphere when certain conditions or factors, such as valleys and mountains, restrict the transport of these pollutants away from an area. When this happens, pollution concentrations can increase rapidly. Allow this evolution map of California give you an idea on the geography. You have the Sierra Nevada on the right side and the coastal ranges to the left of the San Joaquin Valley in the middle. Offhand, it looks like a pit in the middle of the state. And that's exactly an accurate depiction of the geography of Central Valley. The Central Valley is literally a valley, which means that it's surrounded by mountains and has flat ground. Let me give you a visual on how air flows through different ways. In this GIF, <laughs> it breaks it down by the different aspects of airflow. And this is depending on the angle of the object, which in this case, it's a wing, but it could be anything. And look at the stall part and how the air starts to curve like a circle. Now think of that object, similar to a mountain. A mountain would stall air, which would cause airflow to be sporadic. With this in mind, 
here's a picture on how air flows around a valley that shares two mountains side by side or on each other side. The air really doesn't escape and instead recycles through the valley, usually from north to south of the valley. The majority of the air sits, which is a bad thing. Remember, airflow is important because it allows things to breathe. Without enough airflow, this gives more opportunity for pollutants to sit in an area for long periods of time. And you could probably understand where I'm going from this. So we were able to define what pollutants were. Now let's go deeper to see what are the types of air pollutants. This is important to know because lots of technical information pertaining air quality include these terms in some way or another, but you should be able to differentiate all of them. It might take time, but I'm gonna try my best to explain it in a simple way. Here, we have the first one being carbon monoxide, you know, also known as CO2. And a majority of the sources, they come from vehicles and machinery that burn fossil fuels. Lead is another one. Lead can come from many things containing metals, such as lead acid batteries and old paint. Nitrogen oxides or NO2, when it's interacting with water, um, it can form actually things called acid rain, which is really bad for the environment. And it's also found in burning of fuel and power plants. Ozone. Ground, now, there's good ozone and there's bad ozone. What we're going to be talking about here is bad ozone, which is considered ground level ozone. And this is harmful because it actually creates sort of a substance called cause. It develops a sort of a substance called smog, which is very harmful, especially in urban areas. I'm not sure if you guys remember, uh, an example would be in the 1990s during um, the LA. LA was hugely known around the globe as having one of the worst areas of smog. Particulate matter or short PM. It's a mixture of solid particles and liquid droplets found in air. We'll go more in depth in the next slide. And then sulfur dioxide or SO2. This is found in burning of fossil fuels and power plants, almost similar to NO2. Now, like I said, in the next slide, we'll go more into that in PM, which pretty much is more important than the others because it's more predominantly known across um, all areas regarding air quality that really impact residents more. And here's why. Well, PM starts uh, stands for particulate matter also called particulate pollution. The term for a mixture of solid particles and liquid droplets that are found in air. Some particles such as dust, dirt, soot, or smoke are large or dark enough to be seen with the naked eye. Others are so small that they can only be detected um, through a specific microscope that, that can really see electrons which are very, very small atoms. Particular pollution includes PM10, which are sizes of uh, cells with diameters that are generally 10 micrometers and smaller. And then we have PM2.5 with diameters that are generally 2.5 micrometers and smaller. Now, how small is 2.5? Uh, PM 2.5. Well, think of a single hair 
from your head. The average human hair is about 70 micrometers in diameter, making it 30 times larger than the largest fine particle. Hopefully that gives you some perspective. PM 2.5 is extremely small. Some are emitted directly from a source, like construction sites, unpaved roads, fields, and smokestacks. Particulate matter contains lots of droplets, and those droplets can be harmful for your health because it can go through your lungs and sometimes can get passed into your bloodstream. And over time, those particles that come from that pollution start to impact your organs. And then from there, um, your organ system. Of all these things, particles that are less than PM 2.5, those pose the greatest risk of health. And we'll go more into depth on the overall issues on health impacts from air pollution. Fine particulates, like I said in P2.5, they can cause shortness of breath, wheezing, coughing, chest pain and fatigue. And then fine particles can make things really worse with those who have cardiovascular and heart disease, as well as those who have asthma and COPD. And then we have ground level ozone. Remember the smog that I was telling you about? Health impacts from there can become difficulty breathing deeply, shortness of breath, a sore throat, wheezing and coughing, and fatigue. And those who can really have conditions worse are from those who have asthma, COPD, and those with emphysema. Following this slide, you're probably wondering, you know, who protects the air? I, I wanted to give you sort of um, a breakdown of three jurisdictions that oversee the air quality in California. First, we have the federal government. And the federal government, known as United States Environmental Protection Agency, they, they do a lot. Um, not just air quality, but a lot more other things. But they themselves really set the standard for air quality uh, uh, for the nation, for other states to follow. Uh, they provide the standards um, and they also regulate interstate transportation. And what does that mean realistically? Well, it means that they look over trains, ships, and planes. These are areas where pretty much anything that's our, that comes from transportation hubs that cross over multiple areas of states and state lines, that's typically the federal government's needing to be overlooking. And then we have the state or the California Air Resources Board. They're the ones that focus mainly on state issues and they regulate mobile sources of air pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, and then consumer products. Um, they look at cars, trucks, and buses. And they're the ones that work with DMV. So you know how you always have to get a smog check every single year? Well, it's actually the rules made by the California Air Resources Board, which sets the standard to work with the DMV to make sure that your cars are not polluting as much and that they have the proper um, air filters for your cars, the proper materials so that your cars don't emit as much. And then we have the local jurisdiction here, regional, which is the Valley Air District. It is an air district. And there are a lot of them in California, air di the Valley Air District being one of the biggest ones. They actually regulate stationary and local sources of pollution. So they don't deal with things that are mobile, that move around from areas to areas, but more things that are stationary, that stand as like a building. 
And here we have examples such as factories, refineries, and residential wood stoves. All of these areas, all of these agencies are important. Um, they do all of their things. There'll be a time for us to go more in depth on what they do, um, but this is the basic information that you probably will need so far. In the next slide, we go more into talking about, you know, how you can really view all of this air quality index in your area. Here are some four options for references that I were able to come up with that you can actually check out on your own. Airnow.gov is a federally regulated monitoring data collection center. And the EPA regulates this. This is one where they work with all the states to make sure that all of the monitors are federally regulated and they're monitoring the proper um, air, da aid, air data. SJVAir.com is one that's actually not as regulated as needed. It's, it's a community air monitor led by actually a nonprofit organization in Fresno. And they've actually developed a really strong network of over a hundred air monitors. And this is community led and it's very exciting. And this is fairly new. This actually, this uh, SJV Air has been around, I believe close to two years now. And it's amongst one of the biggest used ones so far. And I'm really excited to see how far it goes, but. I highly recommend utilizing this because it does provide real-time data. And then you have Purple Air, purpleair.com. Purple Air is a, a really good website where folks can really buy air, air monitors that cost around $200. They're pretty cheap. A lot of air monitors cost around, you know, it can cost from 500 to 1,000. Being able to buy affordable air monitors, allowing the community to have ownership of the data and place it onto an open source um, database is pretty important. And so this is what Purple Air was able to do. And then we have the Valley Air Districts app called RAN. The RAN app um, is another sort of option where course, you have to develop or you would have to develop a, a, an account to be able to use this app. But it is user friendly and it does do a good job with providing a, a, an ease of information specifically for your area and does provide updates for you through texting, through emails or wherever other way you want to get notified. And this is just an, an, uh, sort of an example of what the map is or what a air monitoring map looks like. This is from the purple air, uh, purple air map. This map has actually really increased in, in, in air monitors. I remember there wasn't this much about two years ago, but I think people are really understanding it or they're realizing that it, this is important, that data collection is important because that opens doors for more grants, for more opportunities to bring in more research. Um, and also communities are starting to realize that, you know, if I want, if they need, if they want to really get empowered in this work, it's really up to them to really take the step to, you know, place an air monitor at their home and being able to read it um, and being able to then assess and share out the data through an open source like Purple Air. But, but all in all, all of this with, you know, the four references I've provided, there's actually more that are out there. But overall, the, the, the message here is that data is data. The more data, the more sources, the better. 
the better it is, the more likely we're able to see some sort of transparency and accountability. Um, and it allows for more opportunities for, for funding to go into local programs um, for cities that probably didn't have the opportunities before or didn't have the capacity. But having the ability for communities to become their own science scientists it is encouraging, it's empowering. Um, and it really just took an air monitor to get the ball rolling on things. And I'm gonna end, um, and William, you can stop and pause for folks to be able to uh, interact with the activity and reflection. And here's a follow up. Have you ever looked at air quality data before? How do you feel? All right, so thanks everyone for the, watching the presentation. That brings us to uh, our activity session. And so uh, what we're gonna do is break out into, oh, I don't, oh, there's Vanessa. Okay, I was like, oh shoot, did Vanessa leave? I was like, how can I do breakout rooms without her? Okay, so we're gonna break out into two breakout rooms, uh, one led by Vanessa and the other by me. Uh, and we'll go ahead and have these questions. Um, shoot, hold on. Um, let me just share my screen again so that um, folks can um, have a chance to look at the questions. Uh, but what we'll do is I'll give you a couple of seconds. I will also take a picture of these really quickly. Vanessa, if you're able to take a picture and then that way we can just hop into our breakout rooms. Were you able to take the pictures, Vanessa? Yeah, I got it. Okay, awesome. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause the recording. Number question was. Oh, sorry, okay. I just remembered I had to restart the recording. So go ahead <laughs> okay, and okay. Uh, you can just start from where you were going. And then, um, <laughs> in terms of poor air quality, we're talking about uh, ventilation systems in school and how the, the phrase, phrase goes, the children are future. And um, some people, um, like the particles are very small, like what Jonathan, said earlier, I don't know why I kept wanting to say Nick. Like I even said it in our group too. I said Nick instead of Jonathan, but uh, in Jonathan's presentation too, the particles are very small. And so it's very hard to see in the human eye. And then with more ventilation systems, it can help to reduce those negative pollutants. So we are bringing that up. And then in terms of relaying that message out towards our community, um, Nick brought up using our social media, which is, which is a great tool especially for our generation too nowadays and using social media it isn't just about making um, infographics and knowledgeable posts you can use that to promote even virtual workshops that we may have in order to inform um, our audience too so that's just something that we mentioned in our group nice awesome um liliana reina julian do you want to share a little bit about what our group talked about Go ahead, Julian. Um, yes, we we related it to um a little bit of um health issues we've had in the past. Um, when we don't really think about um air quality and how bad it gets in California, um, when we have uh health uh, related diseases like um Liliana was saying how she has asthma and how it's really hard for her to, you know, breathe and she gets really bad um, allergies as well. And I was just sharing how my, she lived in Mexico when she moved here for like two years and she just started getting sick out of nowhere. Um, she would get really bad allergies, headaches, and um, she met with like this doctor and he basically said the same thing that they told Liliana that she had to move back back to Mexico or back, um, out of California to um to um feel better or to get better because the air quality was really bad. So um I feel like we don't really think about air about how bad our, our air quality is until our health is at risk. So uh, something to keep in mind. All right, awesome. Thanks for sharing. Um, I'll let one more person share if anyone has anything they want to add to what either Rain or Reina 
both said. All right, that's okay, no worries. I'm, I feel like they both encompassed a lot of what we, as in both our breakout rooms, we're talking about. And so with that, um, I kind of want to just leave on this climate topic um, that, yeah, this is something we should definitely, um, you know, I hope that you will all take into consideration as you think about what it is you want to engage the community on beyond just the regular TCC projects that we want you to provide updates on. Um, and, you know, creating the nexus between your passion issues and, and the environmental uh, topics that we're talking about in these, in these next couple of weeks. And so this is just the first one. Uh, we're going to have many more in the coming weeks, uh, going over transportation, uh, energy, water, and urban greening. And so if there's any issues that you see ties with, definitely start thinking about that uh, because you, uh, as part of the final um, sort of activity that uh, as part of a being a climate leader is you're going to have to go into the communities and really conduct your uh, engagement. Um, you're going to want, like, I want to make sure that we're building a nexus between the climate uh, topics that we're talking about and uh, those issues. And so with that, um, we do have an exciting uh, field activity on Saturday. Um, Little Manila Rising is organizing a field observation uh, truck counting activity. Uh, so I will send more of that information out via email tonight or early tomorrow morning. Um, and we're hoping, uh, I'll forward the calendar invite right now. It'll be on Saturday from 10 to 12. Uh, this is one of the mandatory sort of sessions, but if you are unable to make it, I do know that this is a little bit, um, I do like to provide a little bit more of an advanced notice, but of, like we were trying to get all the details for this event going. Uh, so we, I didn't just, I didn't even get any of the information until today, but um, if you're, if you're not able to make it, please let me know ASAP because we'll try to find an alternative project that, or a field activity that can replace this one. Uh, Cause we do need you to attend all 22 sessions. And this is one of those 22 sessions. Um, and so with that, I'll send out more details, but it will be at 10 a.m. on Saturday uh, at U, sorry, at UOP. And so with that, um, and then uh, just to wrap up a couple more house, I house items, uh, I uh, thank you to everyone who has been completing the uh, post-session surveys. I really appreciate your insight and your, um, your input. Uh, I will be sending out the third post-session survey along with all the other information from tonight uh, to you all. Please complete that as soon as possible. Um, yeah, Rain? Sorry, I raised my hand because I didn't want to interrupt you. But for the post-session survey, you usually give us like a fact um, to remember, like for the last one, it was 10 climate leaders. So is there uh, one we need to remember for today's session? Um, that, see, that's the fun part is that I was really <laughs> thinking about how to make this fun and um, tricky um, so that you wouldn't just like look it up, you know. <laughs> um, but um, I guess like one of my quick little tidbit facts then is, um, yeah, um, which uh, organization is leading the um, Climate Leaders Program or is the lead organizer of the Climate Leaders Program? And the answer will be Public Health Advocates. So. Just remember that Public Health Advocates is the lead org. I'm sure you all kind of already know that, but if not already, it is Public Health Advocates um, is the like primary or the lead org. Um, so thank you, Rain, for <laughs> reminding me on that. Um, and then in addition to the post-session surveys, um, please, um, uh, if you haven't already, please send me your work agreement, uh, uh, signed work plan agreement. Um, we will be using that to kind of uh, act as the invoicing uh, so that we can get those checks out to you all. Your first stipend check, I'm sorry, is a little delayed. We're still handling a lot of the paperwork um, to go to, to get those distributed, but we're hoping by the end of next week, you'll either receive it in the mail or, or it'll be distributed through mail or directly deposited into your bank account, depending on whether you've completed your vendor form. Um, and then go, in the subsequent months, we're hoping to get those out sooner. So around the first week of the month, you should receive uh, your stipends. So I, again, I apologize for any inconvenience that uh, the delays in the stipends uh, might have caused, uh, but I'm trying to get that sorted out as soon as possible. Um, any questions from folks? All right, awesome. So yeah. 
Um, I'll send a reminder email later tonight or early tomorrow morning. Uh, so just be on the lookout for that and hope you are able to make it on um, Saturday. All right. All right, awesome. Thanks everyone for a great Thank discussion you. and hope you all have a great rest of your evening.